silence. Um, could you still see? I didn't do the look of silence. Not not the look of silence. Yeah, just I, I mentioned that it's a movie that was uh, it's also together. Us, us, uh, together. Uh, so uh, Christine is a filmmaker, a regisseur. Zajedno so Valentin rabotat na rezimijot sleden film, koji so rabotni od nazi, v momentu te X2068. To je bil zelen umetnik, a Kristina je tukaj večerva so nas, za da napravimo jeden hackathon za pravnje prikaz. Znači, ovaj ki bide interaktivno, čustujete se slobodno, ki je vako vika, da se dvižime, da učestvujete in gledati, ima tukaj postavljanje v ekranima, ima tudi interesen koncept ki bi bo objasnila direktno Kristini in Valentin. Rabotni jazik je bilo angliski, ova se ja sem odgovorom so vas na makedonski in vsakam isto tako je pokanem. Na kraju tudi, ki imamo makedonske primere na poslednjo film na Kristin Sim, koji što se narekel Shooting Ourselves, ki so pereni kameri. To je film, koji što izlaze v 2016 godine in za prv pat je bilo prikažen v Makedoniji, isto tako dokumentaren film. Sega, now I'm giving the word to Kristin. Thank you, Valentin, and enjoy. Hi. Hello. <laughs> so um, today is not so much a, just a speaking presentation. It's actually going to be a workshop. So you're going to come up here on stage and do something in about 20 minutes, um, just so that you know and you can prepare yourself. Um, thank you first, Anna, and thank you to uh, the Philosophical Film Festival in Skopje for inviting us. Um, we are, yeah, it, it's our first time in Macedonia and uh, very, very excited to be here. Um, I see that the festival is growing and has a, a, a really passionate community around it. And I think that that's really um, very good. And I often like this spirit, I think, better than these uh, very uh, established festivals, which uh, are more business-like, let's say, if you're on the, the production side of it. So for, for me, it's really wonderful to meet people who are really interested in cinema or in philosophy or in the intersection between the two. Um, this is Valentin. And uh, you want to just say hello? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an artist. Um, I work with, I make sculptures, and I find things that people throw away on the street or... Um, things that have stories and I work with stories and work with people and their stories um, and at the moment um, I'm working on this project called X2068 together with Christine and look for stories so I'm gonna I'm gonna put a timer on myself because I am notoriously um, talkative so, um, how many people here are actually um, makers of stories or work with stories in some way in, uh, in film or in writing or artwork? Okay, great. Almost everybody. A question to you guys first. So, um, do we have this other microphone around? The yellow one. Da, 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 da. Here it is. Great. Great. There. And maybe, and I'm going to ask you, I'm curious, um, when I say story, and you think about the way that uh, you use story in your work, uh, what do you mean, what, what does it mean to you? What, what m makes a story different from, say, uh, an equation or some other kind of uh, uh, form? If you, if, I would love to just kind of get some views on, on what you as makers, it's great, we've got a lot of makers in the room. So... So maybe, can someone just tell, like, well, when you think of story, yeah, what do you think? Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm very glad that you're here because I really, really admire of, of, of your work. So when I, when I try to make a story, first of all, I think about moving images. What I'm going to do when I start to shoot something, what my story is going to be uh, on the images. So... Um, it's very important for me uh, to make a story uh, about uh, people, um, the, about the political situation, economical situation in the country, uh, in the region also. 
so uh, some, sometimes we think in artistical uh, point of view to make um, something different with images, with colors. So I think that uh, when, we, when we try to, to create a story, first of all, we, we think about how to create a, a, um, a character. So um, I think that uh, we have some difficulties, of course, but we are, first of all, making a brainstorm, uh, thinking about characters and put them into uh, action. Okay. Great, that was a lot. So we got, um, first you started with images, images, um, character. Uh, character, politics, um, economics. economics, yeah. I mean, one thing that, uh, or may, okay, somebody else. Uh, when I hear the, the word story, it comes to me that we live in this big universe and we make this small universe that contains, contains all the universes. Huh. And it's like making a, a world of your own that contains also the outside world. And that, that's the first thing I think about stories. That's a very interesting view. It's a kind of uh, many worlds view. There's a, there's a cosmology that actually, or physics, that talks about a many worlds view. But, uh, this is very similar to what I'm about to talk about. Anyone else want to speak about what stories mean to you when I say the word story? Hi. Um, when I hear the word story, uh, the first thing I think about is an idea. An idea is always related in some sort uh, with philosophy. Because um, as an idea of how reality is, because the story is in uh, some setting, always. And another thing I think about is emotions. It's usually emotions. about emotions when, when I think of a story. I, I usually relate story to a human. So, yes. Yeah. And I wonder if animals have stories or not. It's hard to know, but uh, possible. Um, so, I mean, the, uh, the way that I see stories, and I've been using stories, I don't know, 20 years or something, but actually I think that I've been reflecting lately and I feel that uh, it even came from my childhood um, when I was, I was thinking of stories and I was, um, and I feel like stories for me are a way to organize our consciousness. So it, it's uh, similar to this idea. We make sense out of many inputs uh, by, by creating stories. And stories have structure. They usually have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, they, they deal with humans and emotions. So they deal with perspective. Usually there's a character. Sometimes you can see them from the third person. You, you see them a little bit detached. But sometimes you, uh, the idea, the way the stories work is often that uh, we feel like we get inside a character. And, and we can imagine that we are somebody else, that we are going through experiences that are not happening to us at, at the time. And I would say that this kind of, um, that in this way, like um, consciousness could be seen as the original virtual reality. Yes? I mean, the reason why when cinema came, um, in many ways it wasn't a surprise because I think people had been dreaming about the possibility of cinema for a long time. I mean, first we make drawings and pictures, and then there's a photograph, and then at some point we make the photographs move. But in many ways, I think it was related to something that was actually happening in our minds. When we dream, we can see the images coming. Uh, when, when we think about memories, often we, we can transport ourselves without having any camera or machine. Uh, it, it, it's already happening to us uh, in our own minds. And then I think this power to use stories to feel our way through things that aren't happening to us, that have maybe happened in the past, like memories. Um, uh, it may be um, stories that we've heard from other people. Uh, it could be completely fabricated things. So you can call it fiction, but the, you can also call it a thought experiment. Yes? 
So you have a kind of a story, and this is a thought experiment. What happens if I put myself into this kind of consciousness? And you try it out, and then, in my opinion, if it's a very strong piece of work, usually when you come out of it and you walk out of the cinema, maybe you're a little bit different. Maybe your regular consciousness is, is somehow shifted, maybe subtly, or maybe it's shifted a lot. Has anyone had this experience with stories where you hear a, a story and maybe it changes you? Maybe it changes your life. Has this ever happened to anyone? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and, and for those of us who make stories, it's probably why we make stories, is because we have this possibility to, um, to transform the consciousness uh, in some way. Or, or you could also look at it as kind of mixing, mixing consciousness. Maybe, maybe you don't transform it, but maybe it's going along on this vector and you're going along on this vector and you kind of touch. And then you keep going, but it, your path is uh, changed for having kind of had a, a momentary exchange. And stories are a, a way of um, making more exchanges with persons uh, than, than you would in your ordinary life. Um, I mean, I think stories can be simple. Uh, they can be complex in the way that they present uh, problems and events. And I would say many stories are about problem solving. And I talked about an equation and a story, and I, I, I think that, that in some ways they're also similar. Uh, equations have a certain causality, and, and I think stories are also, it's like this plus this, or this and this, and then this uh, happens. Uh, but it's an emotional thing, I would say, principally, um, rather than, uh, say, a, a logical uh, thing. Or it could be both. Uh, it can involve one main character, or it can be very complicated, like a big mural with many lives uh, intertwined. Uh, we were debating, did anyone see Citizen Kane last night? I saw it, I saw it. Uh, and anyway, we were debating last night, is Citizen Kane actually about one person? Uh, you know, the, the conceit of the film is that it's, uh, about, it's about one guy, and, uh, but my feeling was that it wasn't about this one man, that actually it was like this uh, psychoanalysis of the whole uh, um, American, uh, uh, sort of American political or power, the, the, the way that collective power is used in, in the United States, and that each character represented a certain kind of facet uh, of this American uh, person or psyche. Um, so, just a little order here. Um, so, it's also, I think that stories cater to uh, a complex set of sensual and psychic rewards. I think some of these are, um, are obvious. We are aware of the rewards that we get uh, when, we, uh, when we are attracted to stories, or when we listen to stories, when we remember them. A lot of them, I feel, are unconscious or subconscious. That the rewards that we get, the reason why stories are one of the main forms of entertainment is because we also maybe are getting other kinds of rewards. And in this way, the way that we consume stories and the kinds of stories we consume and then the role that they have in our lives um, actually starts to reflect something about us, about something that happens not in the story world, but in the other part of our lives. Um, whether something that we are hungry for or something that we um, are curious about, uh, whether it's a lack or whether it's um, some kind of resonance, uh, I think that, uh, that this is useful to think about when you're making stories. Um, I would say stories created by a commercial market um, you would say, at the baseline, uh, they can be characterized by um, a concern for profit. And, and often they're seeking to keep viewers watching, uh, particularly television and, say, uh, internet viewing now is, very, I think, very similar. And because the longer the viewers are watching, uh, the more they can uh, advertise or the more they can sell the, the products that they, they use. And a question that we're going to ask in this project 
and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project soon, is what happens when consumers of stories uh, are encouraged to become authors of stories or co-authors of stories. It's happening in a small way because I think on YouTube, for instance, like you have a lot of ordinary people who uh, broadcast literally from their bedrooms. And um, they, it's a kind of a new type of celebrity. And my little bit of analysis, I'm not a massive YouTube watcher but um, of this type of YouTube, but is that like the people who seem to do well are either people who are very humorous um, or are really good at video games. <laughs> it seems to be like, and if you're both, I think you're probably a, a mega star. Um, I mean, and I think that it's, uh, I'm not going to go too deep into this, but there's a writer whom I'm, I'm very interested in uh, for the last six or eight months, is a, name, a man named David Foster Wallace, who uh, wrote a, a great book called Infinite Jest, which is about addiction and um, all kinds of addiction, chemical dependency, but also dependence, cultural dependency, a dependency on television. Um, and he made up the idea of a film that was so entertaining that immediately you watched it, it uh, you were brain dead. You were no longer the person that you were. Um, and the idea, behind, the tragedy behind this film is that, um, is that even though you knew the film was going to kill you, many people would watch it voluntarily because they, they couldn't stop themselves from actually wanting to experience uh, a film so pleasurable that it transforms you completely. You don't die, you just become a kind of vegetable and all you do then want to do is watch this film over and over again. And um, it's interesting. But he, he talked about uh, advertising and television and, and he was saying that, uh, for instance, television um, advertising, it used to say, like, uh, you should belong to a group. If you, if you uh, drink that Pepsi that's on the stage, you're going to be a part of the Pepsi generation. If you're, you, know, you drink Dr. Pepper, you're going to become a pepper. This is like, and, 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 but then later, towards the 80s in the United States, uh, it would become like, uh, if you drink a Pepsi, then you will actually not be part of the herd or the flock you will express your, your difference from the crowd, which of course um, isn't particularly rational because they are actually advertising this to a massive crowd. It's a mass produced product. And how can many people drink Pepsi and all of them be different? Um, this doesn't exactly make sense. And he said that the way that this uh, uneasiness is resolved within television is that um, in order to both belong to a crowd and not belong to a crowd is that you can, um, you start to make television, you become, you, you get inside the television as a celebrity. And so in this way, you are both part of the crowd and also above the crowd. And so he unfortunately died, I think, before this whole uh, YouTube uh, phenomenon really took off. But I, I think it's a, a very telling thing, for instance, that uh, you have these YouTubers, they have their fans. In, in many ways, you become a fan, and then you also kind of vicariously live their celebrity. You want them to have more and more fans, or you understand this, uh, this desire to go from being um, a common viewer, a sort of anonymous, uh, to being a person whose face is on the screen or whose creations are somehow followed or watched by many people. Um, so, but this, what we're trying to do is, uh, is something beyond that. It's not about creating celebrity for people, but it's actually about um, what we try to do now is uh, we have a project called X2068. It's gone through some different names because uh, I've been thinking about this project for about seven years and developing it. And X2068 is about a fictional character named X who will be 23 years old in uh, 2068. So about 51 years from now. And, um, and what uh, we're asking people to do is to actually collectively dream about her. So we will be doing a lot of participatory things. Uh, we will be doing workshops. Um, in this instance, we, we're kind of experimenting. So uh, it, I just say that in the beginning so that there's no uh, 
if you don't feel we're exploiting you or something. But um, <laughs> we, we're we experimenting with this. We will also be working with a lot of specialists. So we'll be working with scientists and writers and artists, people who are crafters of stories as well. Um, and we want to talk about this woman and what her life will be like. In particular, we're going to talk about food and the future. Um, what kind of food will uh, uh, this woman X be eating in 2068? And how will uh, food chains or food webs, if you want to say that, and food culture be affected by, say, climate change and pollution? And to think about uh, these things, I'm going to explain all the food that's on the stage. And um, the idea, the purpose behind it, I would say, is it's a kind of experiment in democracy. I think that, um, unfortunately, we see at the moment that there is a kind of uh, a terrible uh, crash course or irony that's coming, I, I think, between um, capitalism and democracy, in my view and uh, the ways in which maybe they were are not compatible and maybe have never been compatible. And I think that, um, and what we are trying to do is open up the creation process because we feel that democracy is only really works when people understand themselves as co-authors of history with important roles to play, even though they may never control the whole story. They may never be the director or the author, per se. Um, and I mean, the idea that we are merely spectators of our collective story and that our role is mainly to turn on the screen and watch history unfold is, to me, a very deadly mistake for us. Um, and I, I think that there are many ways in which I think, um, particularly I, I, I'm born and raised in the United States, and I feel that uh, uh, many people think that politics is amusing and uh, th that uh, it should be entertaining. And so they are actually um, trying to make an entertainment out of it. But the, it really comes fr inside from the idea that the actual thing that politics is doing is, is um, they're detached from that. They don't actually have power there. And so it's more like voting on a reality TV show rather than actually having structure or power over the content to, uh, of what they're viewing, um, ultimately creating the structure of their lives and maybe less so their own lives than the lives, uh, say, 30, 50, 75, 100 years in the future. Um, in the way that we inherited the conditions of the last 50, 75, 100 years, uh, we also, uh, either by our action or our inaction, um, we leave that legacy to those people behind so, or who are coming ahead of us or go, go forward. You can think of forwarders behind. It depends on you. I'm over the 20 minutes intro. Um, so the last part I will say is that um, I, over time, have, have thought very much about the way in which um, what we think about, how we use the virtual reality and the consciousness in our minds uh, actually um, changes uh, what we are and, and how we behave. And my hypothesis behind this particular experiment about the future, I have, if you've seen The Act of Killing, or um, uh, tomorrow we'll be sc uh, screening Shooting Ourselves, which is about the weapons industry, that's about the present and the past. I have generally worked a lot about the past people who take memories and bring them into the present. So it's about the way that the past is living inside of the present. And after doing this work for a long time, I had started to develop a question about the way, how does the future exist in the present? In what way do we imagine the future? And in what way do, is, is this imagination of the future actually conditioning the real future? And I have this idea that we condition the present in favor of what we imagine with the greatest intensity. So if we imagine some apocalyptic scenario over and over and over again, and we work out in detail how we would uh, try, what kind of character would we be in the, in the story and so on, that actually, um, I'm not saying that we predetermine that, but we make it a little bit more possible. 
And that um, if we fill up our imaginations with stories that are created by strangers who may care very little for our well-being, um, we live passively in the wake of recycled hopes. Um, you know, for instance, that technology or mutant superheroes are going to rescue us uh, from a terrible problem, like we're living in Gotham City and some, some hero is going to come. Or worse, that we are somehow beyond help and should just kind of enjoy the end times, as it were. Um, this project is actually about trying to get people to... Um, it's using the production process and turning what... I'm, I think, uh, a little bit unusual in the sense that I, I, I've uh, often used fiction inside of documentary. I use this story-making process to catalyze a process that, that happens actually uh, in front of the lens and unfolds in a documentary way. Um, I think in this way we would collect experiences, we would do something with uh, people, say, in, in Indonesia or so on, and then, but then we went back to a conventional mode of production, which is that uh, we would then collect up all the footage, we would log it, select it, edit it, re release it, etc. And I think what we're trying to do now is to actually turn the, the production process inside out so that we have these events and we'll have, we're going to start to have apps and uh, a portal online where people can actually engage uh, and make stories. And we're going to ask people um, to help us or to work with us and to debate with us in the production space uh, and um, create a series of, say, fiction shorts or maybe also things that are stories that exist then in games, in interactive games. And in this way, um, Maybe in the beginning you don't know about the process and you just watch the uh, you just watch the the television program, but then the idea is that uh, what we hope is that you know you say yeah, but do you know how the program is actually made? And then for those people who are curious, they can actually participate in some way in making the next episodes of the program. It could be a very small way. Uh, this is something that we're we're still experimenting with, and so it's like a it's a production process where we crowdsource the stories about our own future. And the idea behind this is that um, by transforming you into a co-author and also using a single character who is actually more like a super character, she will actually have many names and faces and not just a single one. We use her as a place to project our, our own thoughts or our own selves. Um, and that we, um, the bigger idea is that when enough people actually start to engage in this and we have a certain number of uh, interactions between them, let's say debates between pessimists and optimists, for instance, or so, is that um, we'll start to see a phenomenon uh, that is unexpected. Um, and, and for me as an artist, I think this is always... Uh, something that I, I'm searching for. And most of my work is experimental in the literal sense that it is actually a huge experiment and then we just put cameras in front and document it and then later um, process it. This is different in that it's an open-ended process and we will be uh, documenting along the way and we will also be um, distributing or disseminating along the way and that the process uh, doesn't end and that people actually get to participate. So, um, I was going to say something ah, about movie. No, no. I'm going to skip all of that. So, now we're going to get to um, the part about where, where you get to participate. Um, do we want to read the story? Mm, it's a nice story. Mm. <laughs> maybe maybe uh, the first thing is that we're going to distribute some papers. These are just stickies, pens. If you have a pen, don't take one. But um, should they pick something here or write something on the, the paper if they haven't bought something? I think they, no one bought anything. Did anyone actually bring anything from their kitchen? Yeah. Oh, excellent. <laughs> no, it That's doesn't okay. have to be food. 
We, we asked people to bring something from the kitchen, but we weren't sure if people would do it or not. So take... Uh. Yeah, okay, fantastic. <laughs> Ah, okay, fantastic, fantastic. So if you take um, four sheets of paper, those of you who actually brought things, you only need three. Um, and uh, for those of you who have not brought anything, you have either the choice. You can look, we have gone shopping this morning at the green market and uh, we picked some things. Some of them look, uh, we tried to pick some things that were typical of the region. And, uh, and, and maybe some other things. But um, if you want to come up and you just choose, choose an item. Um, and then the first paper that we ask you to write is, um, why did you choose this item? So if you can, and it doesn't have to be a very deep reason, even though this is a philosophical film festival. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I, I'm much more interested in what uh, comes out the top of your mind. So. First, why? Okay, yes. Valentin is saying I should explain why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. So this, um, this process is the beginning of something that we're going to be doing uh, where we use... Ha has anyone ever done mind mapping? Does anyone brainstorm in a kind of map? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do this. I do this. We, we, we do this a lot. Uh, <laughs> And um, it's a certain kind of way. It's a map. It's um, a map of ideas. And so uh, last year we tried to do a certain. Uh, we we worked more with randomness, and we created a chain story game with an app, where uh, you hear one story, part of a story, and then you have to make up the next part. But you never hear anything except what the last person has said. And then in the end, we got all these fragments of stories about this woman. This year we're doing it a little bit differently. We have all these scientists and artists on our team now. So we are going to be making these uh, maps. We will make an about food in the future. So we will make a, a biological food map with scientists. We will make a socioeconomic food map um, mm. with uh, politicians or specialists. But, um, and, uh, and we are going to be making emotional food maps. And this is the part where uh, we are going to be working today, is that uh, we are going to look at food and emotion. And, um, and then later on, these three maps will be, we will look at what I call hot spots, certain concentrations of points that are interesting or provocative or that have um, created a lot of uh, dialogue or debate in the workshop sessions. And we will superimpose uh, certain points. So the biological, the socioeconomic and the emotional together. And this will become kind of the raw material for the writers uh, and the artists to actually work with. And we'll say, okay, these are your, um, this is the raw material, this is the points that you can use. And we will start to craft what we're calling micro stories. Um, we start to take episodes or scenes out um, and, and, and think about a character in that way. So if you uh, haven't brought something and you want to choose from up here, you can choose. If you don't find anything that you like here, you can also um, remember. Think of something from your own kitchen. Uh, it can be an ingredient, it can be a utensil or something. Ideally, it's something that has some meaning for you. So come and, come and either take something or imagine something. So if you don't have something, come up. Because everyone's going to have to come up here. Anyway, so... I hope Oh, is this honey? It's honey. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Honey? Oh. Yes. Yeah, it's honey. We hope everyone will get something. It's so nice that you brought something yourself already. And on your paper, I'd like the first paper should be um, why did you choose this? It can be as simple or as complex as you want to make it. Yeah. 
Does everyone have something? Ah, you got the bread. <laughs> you, you can eat it, I won't tell anyone. <laughs> Just have something left. <laughs> Paprika, hazelnuts, apples, sage, tomatoes, garlic. Yes, it's a tradition. It's a tradition. No. Okay, so for those of you who have written, once you've written your thing, we'd like you to come up, uh, up onto the stage and um, don't trip over the cables, please. Um, and um, we have three tables here. The three tables uh, have uh, signs on them. One of them uh, says hunger. Uh, one of them says comfort. And one of them says uh, belonging. Um, it also says it in Macedonian, uh, courtesy of Anna. And um, we would like you to place your object with uh, your, the paper that says why you've chosen it uh, underneath. And you can, uh, in terms of orientation of how you do it in relationship to what other people have put, this is completely up to you. Just do whatever feels uh, right for you. Have you picked any? paper is going to be um, about um, personality or persona so I would like you we would like you to write on the paper now one um, one characteristic that you really admire it can be someone in your life uh, ideally it should be someone in your real life so uh, pick uh, one characteristic it can be from yourself it can be from someone else but one characteristic that you really admire.
Okay, so when, uh, when you're done that, I'd like you to turn that same piece of paper over. And now um, write a characteristic that is um, extremely irritating for you or that you dislike very much. I ideally, think of a real person. On the, on the back side. Okay, so when you're done that, wait, wait, oh, let them, let them, I'll let you think. Slow. They're philosophers. <laughs> okay, so when you've got both sides, uh, things on the paper, I would like you to consider this uh, your main character. So your character has these traits. Now, and I would like you to actually choose something. It doesn't have to be the object that you placed on the table, but I would like you to put this character underneath uh, one of the objects there or somehow uh, related to some of the objects on the table. And now you can choose anything you like, but it should relate somehow. It can be very abstract, the connection, obviously, between the cheese and your character. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, let, I let your uh, your senses determine where you will place this uh, person. Wait, that's a third one. No, no. Uh, so you have um, you have this paper, and I want you to put it under one of these objects. So come back up to the stage. Uh, it doesn't have to be your object. Uh, it's so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this one is person. this is one person with different traits. Yeah, it can be. We want complex characters. Yeah. <laughs> Will this work one or the other? Look. Can we in in private? paper and the last thing is the most personal so we want you to actually think of um, a memory related to food so we were to, Vant and I've been talking about this for the last few days and um, we are also just to kind of uh, uh, get you in it's uh, of course if you want to do something simple like my mother bakes nice cookies you can say this but uh, it would also be nice to have a very specific things. Uh, like for instance, I, I, um, I remember there was a, a time when I was like 16 or 17 years old where uh, I was really into body control and eating and calorie counting. And um, I think that uh, there were several weeks, maybe months, where I ate almost only oranges. I actually had like a bag of oranges and I was eating something like 700 calories a day, not enough. And I would have this like bag of oranges. And, uh, and this was, um, I don't know, uh, it, uh, a special kind of uh, thing if you've read The Hunger Artist and then have some idea of how addictive it can be. Uh, to actually control yourself and your eating this way. Um, and then the choices that you make are, are somehow uh, affected also uh, by this. Um, but I remember these, this bag of oranges and kind of having this orange smell all the time. Um, is that okay? When we have a small, uh, my, I grew up in a very big family with seven children. And we were sitting around the table, and um, my father was quite controlling, and he would talk all the time, and he would 
Um, check how everyone is sitting and people are sitting straight and people are not eating too much or too little. And he would kind of de boxing my older brother. Um, he's my oldest brother. Um, and he would kind of not to eat too fast, not to eat too much. And then I was kind of in the middle between the two and I would call my brother um, fat and he would beat me for that. And I would just call him fat and he would be very upset about that. And um, he still likes to eat a lot and uh, he doesn't talk much. Um, I wish he could talk a bit more than I eat less. But uh, I think it's, it's fine to eat. But I think he doesn't talk enough with me. Um, that's my food story. So we wanted to, to give you that. Um, and now, of course, it's not you don't have to write the whole story. But maybe if you can write one or two sentences or somehow um, this the idea of a memory, something that happened to you, um, that you associate with food or eating, um, and if you can write that. Okay, so um, take your time. We have a lot of time, actually. So when uh, you're completed your memory, I would like you to again come up and place your memory underneath. It doesn't have to be exactly. I, I think you can make an associative link uh, between your memory and some item on one of the three tables. But it could also, Cassine, yeah. it could relate to the names on the table as well as the objects on the table. Cassine? Mm. You could relate, you can relate to hunger, um, belonging. Yes, you can also relate to this comfort, belonging, or hunger. Soon we have no people left. Oh no, where did everyone go? <laughs> they got too hungry, I think. Okay, so what we're gonna do now um, is we're going to, we're gonna explore what actually ha happened on these tables soon. But um, Valentin wanted to read a short story by a Russian um, man who um, Russian named author author named uh, Daniel Charms. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of charms but uh, this is valentine's all-time favorite story and um it ends with some food yeah. so um it's called the I can hold it. Called the dream it's called the dream Kalugin fell asleep and had a dream that he was sitting in some bushes and a policeman was walking past the bushes. Kalugin woke up, scratched his mouth and went to sleep again and had another dream that he was walking past some bushes and that a policeman had hidden in the bushes and was sitting there. Kalugin woke up, put a newspaper on his head so as not to wet the pillow with his dribblings and went to sleep again and again he had a dream that he was sitting in some bushes and a policeman was walking past the bushes. Kalugin woke up, changed the newspaper, lay down and went to sleep again. He fell asleep and had another dream that he was walking past some bushes and a policeman was sitting in the bushes. At this point Kalugin woke up and decided not to sleep anymore, but he immediately fell asleep and had a dream that he was sitting behind a policeman and some bushes were walking past. Kalugin let out a yell and tossed about in bed, but couldn't wake up. Where are we? Kalugin slept straight through for four days and four nights, and on the fifth day he awoke so emaciated that he had to tie his boots to his feet with string so that they didn't fall off. In the bakery where Kalugin always bought wheat and bread, they didn't recognize him and handed him a half rye loaf and a sanitary commission which was going around the apartments 
on catching sight of Kalugin, decided that he was unsanitary and no use for anything and instructed the janitors to throw Kalugin out with the rubbish. Kalugin was folded in two and thrown out as rubbish. So, an additional story about Daniel Charms is that um, he was slated for execution uh, because he said that um, the Soviet Union was going to lose the war in 1941, um, that they would starve to death, and that um, he actually claimed that he was insane uh, in order to, uh, to, to avoid being executed, um, but then died in the siege of Leningrad, I think from starvation, in the, um, the insane. No, he was in the... He was in the insane part of the, the prison. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so a little story about the author of that. And um, now we're going to actually um, ask some of you um, maybe to come up with the microphone. Is the microphone still here? So we have quite a lot of things. Who was it who picked this potato? Are they still here? Can you come up? Great. So tell us, um, tell us what some of the things say that are on your potato. Or why did you choose the potato? Why did you choose the potato? Yes, that we can start with. Hello. Uh, I chose this potato because it uh, has a layer of protection before it reveals its true self. Ah. And what um. are some of the other things that people have uh, placed onto your potato? Uh, two characteristics, honesty and jealousy. Ah. I don't see the other one. These ones were all there, I think. These ones were all around the potato. Can you read it? My granny's soup. Uh, she made the best soup. Uh, after her death, uh, I started making soup. Surprisingly uh, enjoyed, surprisingly enjoyable or enjoyed it. It was good too, memory. Uh -huh. It was about soup. <laughs> That's it. I think there's three others there. I think they were all, I picked the potato up. So there we go. Uh, we have all these. Humbleness. Ego that thinks that it doesn't have ego. Ego that thinks that what? It doesn't have ego. An ego that thinks it doesn't ah. have ego. Selfishness, persistence. Uh -huh. Insecurity and arrogance. Uh, rooted. Rooted, yeah. Rooted. That was my one. Mm -hmm. It's a funny thing with potatoes because in Norway, um, if you're called a potato, it means you can do a lot of different things. Because in Norway, a potato actually saved them from starvation, uh, especially in the north. And so, and, and it's also used in a lot of different ways. It can be cooked in many different ways. Yeah, so people are called potatoes. Ah, that one is a potato because, uh, you know. And a put yeah, a potato knows how to drive a car. A potato knows how to read a book. And a potato knows how to... Potato is a renaissance vegetable. So... <laughs> <laughs> and can do a lot of um, different things. So thank you. I'm just wondering, like, um, all of these things that come from the potato. So a lot of characteristics. I'm not sure that was there. 
rooted persistence, honesty, jealousy, humbleness, ego that thinks it doesn't have an ego, and granny soup, and making the same soup. And this original one, which I thought was really nice, about um, a potato having this, wow, bright light in their eye. Um, a potato having this layer of protection before it reveals its true self. Now, if I were going to try and make a story around that, maybe, um, maybe this one would be the movement of the story. So you have a person that has a layer, a protective layer around, and then something happens that peels this layer off, turns it into a, a nice uh, soup, or you have all these characteristics um, that are there around it. Um, let's see. Who picked hum who wrote humbleness, ego that thinks it doesn't have an ego? Can you come up? Thank you. You can s the microphone there. So which one is your object? Uh, which one is? F I didn't pick an object. I, I wrote something. I think. Okay. Can you read that? I imagine. I imagine Coco because I, I wondered why I didn't like it as a child. <laughs> <laughs> why do you think you didn't like it as a kid? I don't know. I, now I drink it I mean, every day. Now you like it all the time. Can you pick one of the other things? Maybe them. I just want to, to hear some of the things that people have talked about. If you can maybe choose one other thing. This has only one. What is it for people who can't see? It reminds me of my grandma who was always bringing you mark you mountain mountain tea from uh, from out of the ladies on the market i loved it mm -hmm. can you hold it up so we can see i think it's sage it has a very nice uh, smell and so on so we're getting a lot of family yeah in the food um family is coming up family also came up a lot for us um which i think for stories is quite good because I think uh, in our family is usually some of the most uh, fundamental relationships that we have. Oh, leave your paper there, don't take it away. <laughs> um, and who wrote this about the sage? That was you. Okay, you come and choose something, because I just want to hear about what people have written about, so I want to choose for you to choose uh, Whatever is intriguing. There's quite a lot around the honey. There's some around the uh, the grater. Yeah. I'm that curious is. about the honey too. Can I do the yeah. honey? Yeah, you can do the honey. <laughs> you can do the honey and the pepper because they're quite close together. Yeah, and I'm not sure yeah. why. It's like the potato and the cheese were also together, and it was uh, mysterious. Um, honey, it's sweet, used as a medicine. Uh, the process of making is interesting. And then there is a bee drawn on it. That's quite <laughs> curious. I like that. So what else do we have in here? My grandma's biscuit chocolate cake that reminds me of summer, closeness and friendship. So again, the family motif. As a child, I used to love to steal red berries from the neighbors. They were re very alluring uh, during the night. It, seems, it seemed like they talked. No, it seemed like they talked, I think. That's it? I don't know who wrote it. Yeah, okay. And then we have warmth on one side and arrogance on the other. During the Easter holidays, the whole family was together at my grandmother's house and we were eating homemade ravania and that was lovely. What's ravania? It's a... Sp who wrote this? Maybe you can, you can explain it. Uh, I don't know how to explain it in English, but I just like wrote ravania. <laughs> it's some uh, traditional specialty here from Macedonia. It's like... Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has a sweet taste uh, and it's something like a cake, but it's not a cake. <laughs> 
Okay. Really, really simple. And usually you put sherbet on top, like this Turkish, uh, on, on Turkish delights, they usually put it this really, really, really sweet uh, kind of water and sugar, just okay. a mixture. But it's a really simple sweet, and it's usually grandmas that do it. So, um, um, so during the Easter holidays, ho the whole family was together at my grandmother's house, and we were eating homemade ravania, and that was lovely. But now my grandma is dead, and every time when I eat that type of food, I have strong emotions and feel sad about grandma and the ravania that she made. <laughs> Then we have a dedication, and in brackets down, it stands admire. And then on the other side, there is bossy. OK, this is the irritating characteristic. So dedication and bossy. Should I read also this yeah, one? Yeah, then we have the paprika, the dried, uh, I think it's a sweet paprika, Yeah, pepper. So pepper, I like it because of its shape and texture. And honesty and certainty against all odds. I guess that's the irritating one. And then this is for the honey, I guess. Reminds me of childhood. That's it. Okay. Um, should we have a discussion? Mm -hmm. Okay, do people have. I'm curious how people are feeling now. Or do you see any relationship between what we're doing and possible ways to make stories? That um, there's one special ingredient here that uh, we'll throw this in um, about the future and uh, about the idea that, for instance, maybe some of these foods uh, will change in the future. Maybe they'll be gone in the future. Maybe they won't exist. Does anyone have kids here? No one has kids here, wow. You have kids, okay. And uh, does anyone think that they might have kids or grandkids? Maybe. One, one, two, two, two three. three. In the future, yes, in the future. Of okay, course. okay, okay, no, no, no. <laughs> So it's um, because a lot of you had talked about your grandparents, your grandmother in particular, um, and or cooking the same things or so on. And so this is about generational transfer, about this idea that uh, food is actually one of these really basic uh, memories or things that, uh, that, that, that we belong to. Um, I'm curious about what is on the Pepsi. I just threw that in there uh, because... I chose Pepsi because it, it's become my go-to drink since I became straight edge in meaning I don't consume alcohol. Okay, that's interesting. And the greater, that would be interesting. Pepsi is considered potentially reckless and educated. Sorry. Uh, the greater, yes, 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 definitely the greater. I think we have to explore uh, whose object was it? Oh, you come up, please. <laughs> I think you should do it then. I think this bread has gotten smaller every time <laughs> someone came up. I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure. It used to be a circle. <laughs> it's uh, it's, it's a good. good. No, that's, that's a good, good. sign. <laughs> so let's see. What, what have we got here? So... Um, why I choose this object? Uh, I choose because it's helping me to make the perfect breakfast every morning with the salami, the eggs and stuff like that. So this is saving my life every morning. <laughs> um, emotional stre strength, I think. Strength. Strength. And uh, distance, physical, uh, it's lost mental. I like to eat, but I don't know how to cook. It's because I live uh, with my mother and grandmother, and they are excellent uh, cooks. Cooks, cooks, yes. 
and uh, every time I go uh, in the kitchen, feel like uh, I don't know dress. I don't know this. Every time I go in the kitchen, I feel like a tres no? trespasser. Trespasser, is that correct? Whoever wrote that, is it correct? Maybe. I think trespasser. Oh, oh, a trespasser on their territory, definitely. Yeah. Trespasser. Oh, but that—that's an interesting story. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> that's how I feel when I go into the kitchen. <laughs> 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 and the last one, my father made uh, drools uh, once, and I always have a gag reflex when I think of that. I don't know. A gag reflex. Made drools. What's that? Who wrote that? What does your father make? Drools like. Oh. It's like a thing you should see called Drool. From the mouth. Octopus. Seaweed. Squid. A squid, yeah. It looks like a baby octopus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> you yes on Ivar or no on Ivar? What? Yes on Ivar. Yes, yes on yeah. Ivar. It's Max who was no on Ivar. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was that it? Yes, that's it. I think there's one more. That was me. Uh, eating, um, eating only oranges. Eating only oranges. Uh, starving myself. Starving myself. Uh, yeah. And enjoying it. Enjoying it. Always been hungry. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. This remit likes to make it hungry, and it's in the hunger yes. department. And in let's say, uh, I'm just I'm just gonna read out some of the things that uh, we have. So, yeah. In hunger, we also have a paprika here. We have this plastic banana. What is this? It's a banana cutter. Huh? Oh my gosh! That is incredibly clever. Wow. Do you use that? Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. So we have a banana slicer, we have the grater, we have the bread that is uh, half eaten um, that says what? Princi principality, maybe principled and bragging. And this is in. Uh, Macedonian. Oi, oi. Yes, it's Macedonian. Help, help. <laughs> I was hungry. <laughs> 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 no, but that's very good. And that's in the hunger section. And that was, uh, that's very good. And there was the paprika there. Under belonging, we have the sage and the garlic and the almonds and, and the, the apple. apple. Some other things. But the biggest profusion of text was around comfort. Um, is the Pepsi a spoon? The spoon says, when we sit on the table for dinner, my dad likes to slide his elbow on my side where I eat. It's annoying. My parents always tell me to eat more because they think I'm too skinny. Ah. Spoon, because the kitchen always is always associated um, with cafe, coffee. So the spoon is for coffee. Let's see. The cheese. And this is comfort, yeah. The cheese. I like the color and the taste. Cheese. Because it was the food that bonded me together with my girlfriend, our mutual love for cheese actually was how we met each other. I saw her at a supermarket with like three different types of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to ask her why she didn't get the Baruska cheese. <laughs> so that's already a 
a short film, <laughs> I would say. Uh, probably going to be very popular. Um, ah, and Macedonian, more Macedonian. So from two times eating, do not run. Run only if they want to beat you up twice. And in brackets, it's oftentimes that my dad was encouraging in that way for us to eat. Can you say that again? So That's very nice. Don't ever run. Twice from food, from eating, uh, run only if they want to beat you twice. So if they offer you twice to eat, you, you don't say no to it. <laughs> but you say only no if they want to beat you twice. If they offer you food twice, you just always say yes. <laughs> this is another short story, I think. <laughs> it's a beautiful story. <laughs> okay, so. Um, Let's see. We've got we've got about 20, 20 some minutes left, and maybe we take a little discussion. I don't know where you guys are in your heads now. We've done this activity. Um, we're going to be doing something very similar in Tromsø. Um, Tromsø is in the far north of Norway, so we're going to be talking a lot about uh, climate change in the future. We are going to ask you. Um, hold on. Uh, we're going to ask you a bit uh, to do something for us. Should we do that? As have them take the pictures now or at the end? Sorry. At the end. At the end. Okay. So at the very end, we're going to ask you to come up and, and take a picture of a table or a group of objects or a single object. Um, and uh, we invite you to send us a scene or a story, or something that you write um, that is based on that. But I'll, I'll explain it more at the end. But um, who thinks that we're nuts? <laughs> Does anyone see any point in this that, uh, that, that we take from you? Um, like as a documentary filmmaker, I, um, I see myself as a collector and a little bit like an archaeologist. Like you see people and you see the surface, but you know that underneath the surface, there's many things inside. And it, uh, you have to kind of uh, engage with people to understand, OK, where are the stories there? Where are the characteristics? Well, what, are, what are the emotions that are there underneath this surface? And you kind of collect it. And now, I think, um, now in a day and age when everyone has a camera in their pocket, Everyone has a computer, literally, in their pocket. And there's a way in which we can um, ask one another things or talk to one another in a different way. Of course, it's also good this way, when we're actually together. Um, but I see it as um, using different formats and different means to do something um, related to what I used to do just with a camera, say, with a camera crew. I'm digging, we're digging around. And uh, there's also the one big difference that when you start to do it with a group, um, something happens, like a chemical reaction or something. It, it, it doesn't always happen, or it's different each time. But there's this uh, sense of when the group actually does something together, that they start to see it like, uh, OK, yeah, we, we've done this. If you've ever been in a theater project, or I think a film production probably is very similar, a fiction film production, that when there's a rap on the production, there's this feeling with the team of the people who've been on it. But um, I want to hear your thoughts, because most of you are, are filmmakers or story creators in some way. Um, what, what do you think about uh, the possibility of using um, different formats different ways to get people to engage with one another as a as a starting point for excavating let's say stories or starting to get raw material what i actually the way i see it is that in the beginning what you collect is raw material or you start to understand you um you're searching around 
Um, I suppose people who write fiction maybe do it in a different way. Maybe they look inside themselves, for instance, or uh, friends or situations that they're in. But since you're story makers, does anyone want to? And, and you really be, it's okay to be critical. I think that I'm probably one of these contradictory persons where um, it doesn't, it's okay to, if, you, if you think that this is totally nuts. But I'm curious, uh, does, does anyone have thoughts about this process or, or maybe even how, how did it make you feel to like look at this food, to talk about it, to hear what other people's memories are when you say I met my girlfriend in the cheese department. <laughs> I think that this is a really interesting way of combining ideas into one object and then you can make a story out of just uh, the, the paper on the potato, for example. But I also strongly believe that a story is a really subjective uh, thing and that if uh, a lot of people engage it, it will be not, not so emotionally strong as it used to be with one person. So that, that's just my opinion. You mean one person is the author or one person is the main character? No, no, no not the main character. One person is the author. Mm. For example, uh, making music, you, you just cannot combine your feelings with different people and it's just your point of view and others can engage while they're listening but in the process I don't, I don't believe in in group thing <laughs> mm. do, do how many people agree with her that like you can't uh, you can't the, the idea of the um, I would say the the that somehow the emotional depth or impact is related to, to having a, a, a single controller or author in a way. Is yeah. that fair? Yeah, but, but for different, uh, I mean, for documentaries, for example, I believe that you can work in, in a group to, to make something, uh, a thought come to, come to uh, the, the public, those who are spectators and watching. I mean, you, you can uh, put thoughts in people's head by working with a group, but but emotions, I, I believe that it's a singular thing and that if you want to trans transform emotions, I mean that it's just your uh, lonely road. Okay, how many people agree with her? Just a uh, show of hands, I'm just curious. Sort of, sort of, sort of, other people, yeah. Okay, have you ever, um, I mean, I, it, I think that's really, Interesting, and like I think that uh, because I think I come from a documentary background, um, the idea is that the real world is like a palette, um, and it's true there's an artist. So the person who actually edits the film, it's usually more than one person, mm -hmm. but uh, usually it's a team of people who engage in the editing. It's also similar to say sampled music or musique concrète where uh, I really love uh, Musique Concrète, where you, I used to record uh, the sound of trains, lots of different train sounds and doors and trains and things. And I used to compose music out of that. Um, and I was really interested in this idea of sampling from the world and then recomposing or reconfiguring or, or um, the idea of montage, I think, is, is very much uh, related to that. And so, um, can you imagine yourself as a as a story maker working with this palette as raw material that you could make a story out of? Um, uh, it's not my... Uh, I didn't find my, my sensibility there in, in the writings. So I could uh, do a story, but it will be just out of my mind. It may be interesting, but it won't, won't be from my heart. How do other people feel? I'm just, I'm really just curious what your thoughts are. It would be nicer if we were in a kind of more informal room, I feel it's a little bit. But um, do other people have thoughts or ideas from it? Um, well, I think it's interesting how um, people express themselves through colors, objects, 
or from the way they feel, like as an example we could take when someone dies and we wear black. For some black is a sad color, for me is a happy color and I feel well in it. And um, this helps us to understand um, how people view um, the things you know as they are like you I understand that Pepsi on my own and that means something to me and I think that everyone thinks the same but that's that's not quite it because everyone um, can think more weirder or it is going from starting from my way of thinking um, or maybe because I'm still young I always thought like if I'd be always nice to people, there is no chance that people gonna do bad things to me. Because I thought, because everyone is the same, everyone thinks good. And I think that uh, helps not only to give ideas, like as an example, only small words could inspire you to a whole story, but also it shows <clears throat> how different we are and how special that difference is. Um, and actually in the end, that we are all the same, that there is no difference at all. Perhaps, yeah. Does anyone else have ideas from this or? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I find the archaeologist approach, uh, as in digging into people's memories and feelings through food, um, amazing as a, as a style of acquiring ideas for making a story, because any creative process, oh, why shouldn't any creative process have a creative approach to, to acquiring information? and. I feel very um, enthusiastic uh, just to um, be an observer of this project about the uh, um, X, the X project, and I I love the idea. I think it's it's genius. I, I've never it's. I mean, today just expanded my mind. That's what I have to share. Oh, I, I really think your your thought. Sorry, I'm coming back to to your thought. Um, your thought is is very valid, and I think it is important for for someone like you to write your own story. But maybe your mind could expand by in a by being part of a collective uh, process. I also thought of something else during the talk, so yeah. I can share it. I believe that we, I mean, it, it may be a little eccentric view, but I believe that as, as human beings, we are all, I don't think that our thoughts are our own. I believe that they exist all, all around us and that nothing is by chance or by accident. I mean, everything is somehow intertwined. So maybe, I mean, uh, if people find themselves around this one beacon idea, I mean that it is in the ether here. Maybe they're maybe they can work it out because it, it called them the the idea called them all together. So that, that can be too uh, really productive. Why do do people have some idea why we chose food? as the theme, like uh, the idea was to talk about the way the future lives in the present. And to do this, we wanted to evoke um, associations and emotions inside of people. Do, do any, do you have, after having done this, do you have a sense of why we've chosen food? Can you grab it? <laughs> I think uh, that uh, because the food is always changing and uh, in every period of time the food have uh, it's always experimenting on food so every time we have uh, new things and uh, we forget the old one and with the food we have uh, a lot of emotion connections with families friends and i think that uh, the food is that that uh, combine us in group 
as uh, some uh, if this is one group uh, we love these things and uh, we make some difference from the other I think that uh, food represents ourselves in some situations anyone else thoughts on this okay um, I think that when we have dinner or breakfast and it's the only time where we all sit together we all sit together and talk we eat but it's more like even food tastes better when you share it with someone it's about that connection the connections you build up to people and um, the communication it's not always about the food <laughs> mm. yeah yeah, you know, these these are all correct. I mean, in in many ways, I, I think one of the extra things was because in uh, X twenty sixty eight, we're going to start in the Arctic because we live in the Arctic, and the Arctic is one of the places that is changing the fastest uh, in response to uh, climate change, and. Um, but in addition to all these things about food, I mean, food is really basic. We talk about universality. Uh, all humans eat food. Uh, almost all biological beings uh, need some kind of nourishment or uh, food, as basically as you would call it. It is also what links us in many ways to the environment in a very everyday way. Uh, we eat every day, every day. They have to ship food from here to there. The farmers have to grow it. The fishermen have to catch it. Someone has to process it. And all the time there is this process uh, going around uh, with food. And it, 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 it is some kind of link. And I, I feel that like we can link so many things to it. At the same time, is culturally, I think most cultures, uh, most social uh, social rituals or things are related to food. Many, many, many. I think there's very few cultures that don't have some kind of symbolism or rituals or things that, uh, whether it's about the family dinner on a Sunday or, you know, it, it, a, a very, you know, or the holy host. Like there's so many different ways in which uh, food and relationship, it can mean that you're a member of a family uh, or a group of friends or something. Mm -hmm or religion, exactly, in terms of what you eat and what you don't eat, uh, for instance, is, is one of the things. Um, we're sort of getting to the end, should we? I think we can do more. Did you want to show anything? I'm going to show you, actually, if we, we, because we started like 15 minutes late, is it okay to have, yeah, and uh, people can go, so there's, um, I show you because we we have actually uh, a lot of the project has been a um, uh, can we cl uh, shut the lights off on the stage? So this project is in a very early stage. Any way to hit the lights? So just tell you a little bit about where we are. Um, I've been developing this in the background of making, um, the finishing the act of killing, and uh, and all throughout actually the production of the of shooting ourselves, which we'll screen tomorrow. And I hope uh, some of you can make it. Uh, it's a very different topic, but um, last year we actually started uh, practical tests and experiments. And we made uh, an art exhibition in Trumsa in the museum. Um, we made a virtual reality experience uh, from which this voiceover and some of the images are taken. Um, you'll also see some images from um, the things. Valentin made a kinetic sculpture with holograms, where we worked on that together. There was a board game, actually, that was made by Valentin and um, several artists from the UK. Um, and there were several video installations. The main um, source material were uh, fragments of stories that were made by scientists. In what I was explaining before, we had another method which was inspired by the surrealists. They used to play a game called the Exquisite Corpse. 
uh, it's like a chain drawing game, and we used it uh, to make chain stories. So um, this is just the introductory voiceover, and uh, combined with some images from the from the exhibition and the virtual reality experience. Hello, X. If our delivery mechanism hasn't failed, it's your 21st birthday. Happy birthday from us in 2016. This NASA satellite image shows carbon dioxide concentrations in the Earth's atmosphere a little over 50 years from your time in 2066. We are currently 7.4 billion humans on Earth in 2016. We are not perfect. We fight, we complain, we love to fly, we love machines. We are guessing that CO2 concentrations in 2066 are higher than in 2016. And the temperature has risen, and the seas have risen too. Because we need machines that need energy, and long story short, we produce a lot of carbon dioxide. And underneath all that red and purple, what are you, X, up to? message about how we imagine your story. We've been imagining you because, because we want to be closer to you. Because it's fun to escape the present. Because many of us are starting to feel helpless, guilty, a bit crazy. Because imagining you might change how we see ourselves. And that might change what you see right now. Because our story is your story. Because your story begins now with us. So we can turn the lights back on. So this is um, this is just a short uh, thing. In fact, the whole exhibition the whole exhibition was really um, it's it was a way for us to try things out. We see this project more as a laboratory than as a regular production process, uh, or as a kind of never-ending uh, production process where we will continue uh, to make works. Um, to invite people uh, to work with us in a number of different ways that we will invent in the laboratory and test as we've been testing with you today. Um, probably the next time if you see us again, and hopefully maybe you will, maybe you'll uh, see us online, if not in person, then, um, then you'll see that actually we're using, you might see a virtual dinner table and you might see uh, different people who have made different maps because in the end maybe 20, 30 people will actually work very seriously on trying to make different maps that may have different associations with them. As I mentioned, the biological, the socioeconomic and the emotional, which is the map that we were working with today. Um, and in the process of making those maps, people will have lots of different thoughts um, which are being documented and which are going into podcasts or radio programs um, and a documentary film. Yes. So actually, oh, that's one way you can keep in touch with us. Yeah. That's, what about that? We are going to start making podcasts. Does anyone here listen to podcasts? Does anyone know what a podcast is even? It's like a radio uh, show on the internet that you can download from iTunes. Okay, it's not really hit here. Um, so but it will. Yeah, perhaps it will. <laughs> perhaps it will. Um, it's a it's a very big format. I, I think in the in, for English speaking people in the United States, I think twenty three percent of people are actually listening to more than one podcast a week. It's free. Um, 
and we will actually explain what a podcast is so a podcast is a downloadable radio program so it's an on-demand audio program you download it on your phone or on your device and then uh, you can listen to it when you're driving or when you're on the bus or washing the dishes or so on um, it's free. and it's free it's free so we are uh, we're going to be producing a podcast of the workshops that we have with scientists and artists and so on it's uh, more of a factual behind the scenes look um, we will also be producing a, a short fiction series like a television sh fiction series um, it won't be so much about a single set of characters that move on um, like the wire or game of thrones but it will be more like a series like um, if you've ever watched the twilight zone or uh, Black Mirror, I think, is a, a modern version. It's more of an um, anthology of stories uh, that will be created in this way. And for those people who have actually participated in the, making the material for a particular episode, there will be a lot of uh, um, things that they'll be interested in because they'll have understood the options and things that the authors have, have used in, in making it. Um, I do want to take questions, but I think that it's such a small group, and I, I, I hope and, and wish that some of you are uh, coming to the film tomorrow or are going to be around in the festival. We're here until um, we leave on Monday morning, so we'll be around the festival uh, uh, tomorrow and Sunday. Um, the last thing that we wanted you to do was um, to come up here and take a photo. Um, if you have a smartphone, that is, or a camera with you, um, to take a photo of either a single object, it can be the object that you chose, or maybe a group of objects, and, um, and to send us this photo along with, um, and try to imagine that um, you have been able to make a dinner in the present, to make a meal um, with food that is maybe here, or maybe uh, you can combine it with other things. Um, and that some way you could preserve this meal. Let's say there was a special service where uh, we know that climate is changing. I think in Macedonia, um, they say that it may become mm, three, three degrees hotter in the next uh, 30 years or so, and uh, a bit drier. So that maybe some of the th agriculture things may be affected, the kinds of food that is grown here. Also, uh, for instance, with the EU and so on, if, if Macedonia joins the EU, maybe they have to standardize certain productions and things, uh, rice or spinach or whatever. Um, so things may change. And so the idea is to think of a meal now that you might cook, but that you could enjoy with your own granddaughter in 2068. And I would like you to imagine the scene where you and your granddaughter are having this meal that you've prepared for her some 51 years in advance. <laughs> it doesn't matter. That sounds very interesting. You're allowed to write. You you can write about that instead. Okay. Okay, but so you, you get to can you imagine a scene with your granddaughter in 26 or maybe two separate scenes. Let's say you don't actually sit together anymore. It can be two different scenes. Uh, you just your granddaughter. or or something. <laughs> but the, but the idea is to try and think into the future. Use it as a thought experiment. I see fiction as a thought experiment. Um, that we have these vicarious experiences. I, you seem to have a clear picture of what this future uh, can be like in your mind, and I'm really interested in that. Um, so I'd really like uh, to hear about that. So if you can come up and take a picture, it can be anything, and you send it to us. I have, um, I have written here, uh, you can either email it to us, or uh, it's quiet.
Yeah. Yeah. If you don't have anything, that's okay. I'm just trying to escape. Um, but for us, it's also interesting to have your contacts um, so that we can be in contact with you um, and inform you about how things evolve. Here we go. So maybe if we can, uh, yeah, for those, if you don't have a phone and can't take a picture, you can uh, take something. And also, um, if you want to take something home with you, um, because we, we don't live here. So all of these things, uh, feel free. But if you make, if you eat, if you take one of these things home with you, can you please send us a picture of you having it? So a selfie, please. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, a really interesting uh, phenomenon in South Korea where, um, as you say, many people eat alone, um, but they don't exactly eat alone because they watch uh, live YouTube streaming of other people eating. So there's people who have become really famous um, because they order a lot of takeaway food and they fill their whole table with food and they eat it live in front of the camera. And then uh, other people are eating as well, I think, at home alone. Are watching them and eating. And, and watching and maybe texting them, chatting them on the, on, the th on the thread. So they're not alone. And so, but they... But that's in 2017. That's 2017. That's, that's a big thing in South Korea. It's actually really interesting to, to look at some of the videos. Yeah, there, the, the, the number of plastic surgery. Plastic surgery, yes. Going on to the top, and um, I don't know, like there is no more, there is no much space left for um, showing your personality and actually, um, you know, appreciating the personality and the reality of a person, yeah. uh, not for how they look like, just with their inside. They're so focused on. on yeah, my family is Korean, but I, I, I but I, I went to, we went to Korea recently, and it, it's true about the plastic surgery, um, and there's a, a lot of uh, other things, but um, yeah, it's interesting that Korean soap operas are also extremely popular. Um, but in, in any case, so please come up and take pictures um, and s please send us. We have, you can either email me, um, you can Facebook us, you can post it to Facebook, Twitter or Instagram, any of those things. Um, and we really would be happy to see you. And also, even if you don't send us a story, if you do actually send me an email or um, or a message on any of the on, on any of the so bees won't exist media. in the future. <laughs> That's possible. Maybe we'll have electronic bees, and then. Um, but then um, we can get in touch with you later as the as the project develops. Thank you so much. And if, and if you have questions for me, please don't, uh, or, or Valentin, which please just uh, grab us later uh, at any time. I think one of the greatest things about a smaller festival is that there is actually time uh, to sit and have a coffee or a beer or something. And, and we're really, um, we've come here to do that with you. So I'm sorry that we didn't have a lot of question time, but uh, thank you very much. Thanks to you, Christine, and we hope to see you tomorrow for our film. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, come to the film. Yeah. It's a real party, shooting ourselves. Organic. He eats only carrots and organic food. Did you know that organic? Really? Yeah, you eat very much. Send us something about your time.
Okay, so I need to go again. Uh, I think. Of course, okay. thank you. Yeah, 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 of course. If you brought something, you should take it. There, wait, 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 let me give you something else. Would you like beans? No. No? Potato? Apple? Thanks, thanks.